All right. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Hello. All right, everyone, we're going to get started here. Wow, really great job quieting down. Very impressive. We have a good group here. All right. So my name is Sam Casey. I'm a program manager uh, for information systems. And you'll hear from me a little later. But first, I just want to get up here and uh, give you a quick idea of what we're going to be covering tonight, OK? So you're going to hear from a few different people uh, that are a part of the multidisciplinary graduate engineering team that works specifically with information systems. So first off, um, you're going to hear from Dr. Tristan Johnson, the dean of MGen, um, Haley Lyons, a student service specialist. You'll hear from me again. Uh, you'll get a you'll meet one of our full-time faculty members, some of our grad ambassadors. Um, our co-op team and some successful co-op students that we've had during their time here. And then to finish it all off, you'll hear from your program director, uh, Dr. Bugrara. Okay, so we have a really good night in store. Appreciate everybody being here. Uh, I know it's a little bit later, and we'll make sure we'll run through this, give you a lot of good information. So with that, if you guys could just give a quick round of applause for Dr. Tristan Johnson. Good evening. How's everyone doing? 
Oh, you, you can do a little bit better than that. How's everyone doing? Okay. Welcome to Northeastern University. It's a pleasure to welcome you here on behalf of Dean Aubrey and the Dean's Office. It's a pleasure to have each one of you here at Northeastern in the College of Engineering in the program Information Systems. This is one of the most important programs on campus. The courses that you'll take, the skills that you'll develop, the attitudes that you'll adopt, the friends that you will make, the challenges that you will have will prepare you for a successful future. Your goal and our goal are the same. Your purpose in coming here is the same, that you end and graduate and are successful in the workplace, contributing back to many different types of companies, different countries of the world, and also to make the world a better place. We're happy to have you here. It's nice to meet some of the parents and sister from Virginia, kind of my hometown. It's a pleasure. Also, I'd like to welcome all of our faculty and staff that are here um, that are supporting this program. There's a lot of things that will happen while you're here at Northeastern. Boston is a beautiful city. You'll have approximately two years to enjoy it, if not longer. But in the walls of Northeastern is where you're going to find that you're going to be challenged, but with tremendous purpose and intent. So much like a family, your academic family now, want to challenge you. Not because we want to hurt you, but because we want you to grow. So as you interact with the co-op faculty, with the professors, with the program director, with with the, um, the um, administration and so forth. Your opportunities are here are balanced. We have created an opportunity for you, which you've seized, you've earned that, uh, that right, you've come here, you've been selected to come here. Now it's your opportunity to seize this and become all that you can be. One of the most important things, by the way, I have three sons. One is in college and then one is uh, actually not in college yet and the other one is about to go. But one thing that I try to teach them is you're going to be given opportunities, but it's up to you individually of what you do with that. The faculty work very hard, the staff work very hard to provide you the right opportunities so that you can learn quickly, effectively, efficiently, and also the right skill sets, right? So as you go through, some of you have uh, different varying skill sets, but in the classroom when you meet the faculty, you're going to really see things differently. And this is what we get excited about, to be honest. The last thing before I, I turn the Mike, back over to Sam, is that um, you own it. When you get done, it's your degree, not my degree. It's not Professor Robin's degree. It's, it's not Professor Bugar's degree, it's your degree. So it's up to you. We know that students that own their learning outperform those that don't. Of course, you're in grad school, so what would you expect? But I, 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 I give you all my best wishes for a successful two years, maybe a little bit more if you um, if you take a couple extra classes or not. But it's my best wishes that you have all the success, that when you come across challenges, there's people all around here to help you. Just like your family, you have an academic family now. And although I might not know you, if you have a problem, I can help you. There's many people here to support you and to challenge you. So may you be challenged appropriately, may you work out hard, may you take the opportunities. Also, it's just a beautiful thing when you're learning because when you learn, you own it. No one else owns it. No one can take it away from you. Learning is that. When you understand things and can do things, it's yours. And that's the beauty. We're giving you these opportunities. But also, on behalf of all the university, we are excited to have you guys back here, or have you come to Northeastern, to have you here. And we look forward to an engaging two years for your program with new opportunities and new adventures for you. Again, welcome to Northeastern, and thank you very much. All right, hello everyone. So I'm Haley Lyons. Some of you may have heard from me. We may have communicated via email. It's really nice to get to see you all in person. I am your student service Services advisor, I'm also the graduate student academic advisor, and this is my office location, and that's my email. So you may be wondering, uh, what is graduate student services? Well, at our office, we're a team, and we handle all of the academic course registration, graduation requirements, academic probation. We also do fun stuff, like send you communications with newsletters, um, 
and then as well as host events and tell you about opportunities. We also support the funded students, those who are on fellowships or Fulbright scholars. And then as well, we act as the um, SAVIS contact. So for the international students, we partner with uh, the Office of Global Services on academic matters affecting student visas. So if you need any forms that have a SAVIS save signature needed, you can come to me and I'm more than happy to review your record and sign off on it. Uh, so OGS, the Office of Global Services, they are located on the fourth floor of L Hall. So if you're an F1 student visa, OGS handles all of your visa. If you have any questions, you can definitely ask me, um, but I might send you over to them just because they know the most and since we're dealing with important documents and information, they're the best people to talk to about that. They can also help with any student immigration, uh, employment, tax information, OPT, CPT, OGS, Office of Global Services, is the place to go. They also have uh, their own community that you should definitely get involved with, and they have activities and events, and so hopefully you guys will attend, if you haven't already, one of their orientation sessions, and you'll learn a lot more from them. Okay, so now I'm going to discuss the role of the Graduate Student Services in the context of three areas. So the first is the resources that are available to you. And it's your responsibility as a graduate student to make sure that you're aware of all of these resources and taking advantage of them. Okay, so now we'll talk about some of the resources. So if you haven't already, which hopefully you have, My Northeastern will be a great resource for you. It has a lot of links, such as access to course registration, uh, your Husky email. So before today, you may have been communicating with our university through the email address that you used in your application, but from now on, we're gonna be using your Husky address, so you just wanna make sure that you're checking that. Um, that's where your professors or I will be emailing you. You can also access your billing statement as well as Blackboard, where your professors will get in contact with you with course materials, your Husky card, and lots of other fun things. So make sure you check out MyNorthEastern.com. And I would also recommend bookmarking this webpage. So if you have any questions or you forget, you can always check back. Oops, sorry. All right, so the Registrar's Office is another really awesome resource. They do have an on-campus uh, location. It's at 271 Huntington, but they also have a ton of resources that are available to you online. They manage your academic record, your they have your transcript, you can get the course registration schedule off of the registrar's office. They also have the academic calendar, which has the add and drop de deadlines. And most of your interactions with this office will be through the website, um, but again, there is an on-campus option as well. So this is your catalog. So you guys are starting your master's career in the year 2018 going into 2019. So from this point on, this is your catalog. So any course information, core courses, this is your go-to to have the most accurate information, this graduate catalog. So it has the official curriculum, all the requirements, and then also it's important to make sure that you're familiar with the Student Bill of Academic Rights and Responsibilities, the Code of Student Conduct, and as well as the academic policies and procedures. So this is the calendar that you can find off of the registrar's website. I would definitely take a look at this. You may or may not know, but Monday is a holiday, so my office will be closed. Classes don't start yet. So the first day of classes will be the fifth, and if you have any questions about, oh, when can I add a class by, or when, can I, when do I have to drop a class before I get charged, this calendar will have all of those dates on it for you. Again, though, if you have any questions or doubts, you can always ask me. Okay, so there's my team. So we all are responsible for different programs. So I am the information systems program person. So if you have any student services needs, I'm your go-to. And this is our website. So you're more than welcome to explore and see what kind of fun links we have. Um, the main reason that you might be coming onto this page is for forms. Um, okay, so I don't know if you noticed, but I have a boot on my foot, and I'm going to tell you a story. So a few months ago, I had some pain, but I thought that I could deal with it myself, 
So I didn't go to the doctors. I didn't really tell anyone. I just tried to deal with it. And then flash forward. Oh, you can't hear me. Hello? No? Hello? Oh, okay. All right. Anyway, I have a boot on my leg. I ignored the pain for too long, and I ended up with a broken foot. So why I'm telling you this is because Let's say you're in class and you're feeling really confident and then all of a sudden you encounter a new piece of information and you're not sure how to sort it out, you're unfamiliar with the material. I want you to speak up and not end up with it being so bad that you can't return. So we're all here to help you. We have so many resources available and it's okay to not know. You know, you're here to learn. So make sure that you reach out to your professors, your TAs, me, anybody, if you're having any problems, because we want to make sure that you're successful and you don't end up in a boot or something. OK, so the reason that I'm bringing that up is because you would come to me for academic probation. So academic probation occurs when you fall below a 3.0. So each semester, you need to have a 3.0 GPA. So you can always check the catalog for the academic requirements. And in order to graduate, you must have a cumulative GPA above a 3.0. And you, as well, you must meet your degree program requirements. So if you have any doubts or questions about that, you can find all of the policies and the curriculum requirements on the catalog website. So again, just familiarize yourself with these academic requirements, because it is the responsibility of the student to be sure that you're doing your best in your master's journey. Again, if you do have any questions, because I know it's a lot of information, you can let me know. So this is the academic probation policy that I'm pretty sure you all had to sign off on. If you want to go back in and review these requirements, it would be a good idea. Um, and as you can see, we, we take academic probation very seriously. And so it's important that you do your best to maintain a cumulative GPA above 3.0. After, if you end up with below 3.0 on your first semester, then that's academic probation one. If you have a second term, consecutive term under 3.0, then you're dismissed from the college and you can appeal to be um, given another semester's chance. So again, if you're feeling any doubt in your classes, make sure you address the issues immediately so that we don't end up having academic probation cases. Assistance. Okay, so I'm your go-to for course registration, but you'll have to bear with me. There are a lot of you and there are only one of me, so I do my best to respond and to give you all your first choices and everything, um, but I appreciate your patience. So if you encounter an error, so if you see here, this class uh, is chemical engineering course, and you're getting a program restriction because you're only able to take classes through information systems or computer systems engineering. So if you tried to add a chemical engineering course, you would get this program restriction, and then you would not be able to add the course because it's not a part of your curriculum. Okay, so then online courses. Uh, there are a couple different types of online courses. International students, it's just really important that you're always maintaining status. So you must have at least four on-ground credits. So if you're in your last semester and you only have one class left, it must be on-ground. Now, if you're going on a co-op, which we'll learn about more later, you do have the option to take an online course and you're still maintaining your status. Again, any questions, definitely let me know. I know it's a lot of information. Okay, so for student services assistance, my office is located at 130 Snell Engineering, and our office will be hosting extended walk-in hours for the next two weeks. I'm going to be out of town doing orientations for our regional campuses, so I'm going to hold your extended office hours the following two weeks. I'm gonna send you guys an email so you don't have to memorize this right now. And then our normal walk-in hours are usually Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. So during those three days, that time period, you can come in and sign in and then I'll see you. If you come in outside of those um, time periods, I won't be able to see you unless we have an appointment, um, which I'll get to in a minute. So when you do come to the office, you just wanna make sure that you have your nine-digit NUID 
So a lot of places on campus will want this, so you want to memorize your specific NUID. And then also when you come, if you could just have the course information, that way I can know what you're talking about immediately and help you out as efficiently as possible. And then the CRN is the five-digit code that we had given you, and that applies directly to the course in a specific section. All right, and then how to reach me. That's my email address. Those are my walk-in hours again at Snell Engineering. First floor, uh, big glass windows. And okay, so if you have an issue that's maybe more personal um, or is going to take longer than a quick you know, check-in, you can definitely schedule an appointment with me. Just give me at least 24 hours in advance so I can um, get you in my calendar. And then if you could just provide your name, that NUID again, and then if you could explicitly explain why you're looking for an appointment so I can best assist you. Okay, also, our office is only open Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 5, so I'm not able to respond to emails outside of those times. So if you email me Friday night, don't expect to hear from me Saturday morning because I am not in. But I will get back to you as soon as I can. All right, so we're super excited to have you guys a part of our community, Go Huskies. And these are just some opportunities for you to get involved. The first two are clubs, but there are a ton more. So definitely check out um, OrgSync or any organization fairs that you might encounter. Then there's also the Career Center, the Writing Center, there's Student Employment. And then the bottom link is to the Boston area. So when you're done doing your homework and want to go out into the city and explore, the Boston calendar has lots of fun, sometimes free activities around. All right, so what's up next? International students, make sure that you're checking in with OGS. Uh, if you haven't already, attend that orientation. And then get ready for classes. That'll start next week. And if you're a social media person, feel free to connect, follow, like, whatever you guys do. Those are our social media accounts. And I look forward to working with you guys. Thank you. Like, <laughs> no, sorry. All right, I'm back. Um, so, as I said at the beginning, uh, I'm Sam. I'm the program manager for information systems and computer systems engineering. Um, that is me on the screen, believe it or not. Uh, and my email, of course, uh, is one that you can take down. Uh, my, main, my main role here with the program is working with our program director and our faculty members to get the courses on the schedule and really take into account what students, you, are learning and what you're interested in learning and making sure that we're creating um, classes each semester that fit the needs that students want, because that's obviously very important and why you're here. So we're going to get right into it. I'm going to go over uh, your degree requirements. Um, you know, again, a lot of this information you've probably already seen, um, whether it's through your pre-registration or just scrolling through the, the Northeastern graduate websites. Um, the catalog page, familiarizing yourself, but I know it's a very um, stressful time. There's, it can be, feel a little overwhelming, information overload. Um, so I'm just going to quickly run through some of the options that you have coming up um, this, this semester. And just to get it in your mind again, make sure that you guys can, can see what's being offered, what teachers will be, will be teaching the classes, and, and get yourself set up to have a great semester. So I know it's a little, a little tight up there at the top, but that's the most important, your core requirements for as an information system student. It is the in Info 5100 Application Engineering and Development course and the 5101 lab associated with it. Please keep in mind you do need to be enrolled in the lecture and the lab, okay? And um, that you, you all should be registered and taking that uh, this fall. After that, um, you obviously will have an elective that you can sign up for, but during your two years here, um, completing your degree, 
Uh, you'll have to take seven four credit uh, elective courses. And it's important to note, these can only be from information systems or computer systems engineering uh, classes, excluding uh, IoT, the Internet of Things. You'll see that when you go on and look at CSYE classes, um, there are IoT sections mixed in there. Just make sure you avoid signing up for them um, because that would not count towards your program. Um, and then a footnote at the bottom, just all 32 credit hours must be completed from CSYE and or IS. I said it again because it's very important and just trying to get it through your minds here and transfer credits are not allowed. So let's run through the app engineering sections real quickly. Um, it's important to note that our program is very fluid when it comes to sections. You'll see changes coming up right up until the beginning of the semester. As some of you might even note, um, as you look through the three sections available this fall, that one has gone from 8 to 10.30 to 9 to 11.30, so you'll have an extra hour to sleep. Um, and then there are uh, right now 10 lab sections, and you'll be, you'll be getting lectures from Professor Bugrara as well as industry leaders um, in this class, so there's gonna be a lot of great great um, information coming from this class like never before. So one that you're gonna be really excited and I think is gonna be a, a lot of fun to take. Um, let's get into your electives um, that you've seen. These are all from the pre-registration, but there are a few little tweaks in there that differ. Um, you may have even gotten an email from me today talking about classes, but Info 6150, Web Design and User Experience Engineering. We have two sections, one Saturday afternoons with Vishal Chala, and one on Wednesday evenings with Amutan Aruaj. Info 6205, the Program Structure and Algorithms course. Um, we have one of our full-time faculty members, Robin Hilliard, teaching those. Um, he's standing up right there, and you're gonna hear from him uh, in just a couple of minutes here. And he's teaching uh, two date, those daytime sections. You'll notice they run twice a week, the first one is Wednesday, Fridays, 11.45 to 1.25, and the Tuesday, Thursday. The Tuesday one, note, 11.45 to 1.25, but the Thursday is in the afternoon starting at 2.50. So just some things to keep in mind. Uh, info 6210, the database, data management and database design. Uh, another one of our full-time faculty, Yusuf Osbex, are teaching those sections. Um, you'll see the class times and CRNs similar to well, not the CRNs, but the class times are similar to Professor Hilliard's. Info 6215, Business Analysis and Information Engineering. Um, we do have one section with Gail Rainus on the schedule right now on Tuesday evenings, and an online section with Andre Gustian. Uh, continuing on, Info 7385, Managerial Communications for Engineers, Monday evenings with Trisha McConville. And Info 6105, Data Science Engineering Methods and Tools. Um, those are with two different full-time faculty, kind of rounding it out. Uh, Dino Constantopoulos on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then Nick Brown on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And then going into the CSYE sections that Professor Bergerara recommends for first-term electives for IS students. Um, the CSYE 6200 Concepts of Object-Oriented Design. We have three different sections, one on Monday afternoon, one on Monday evening, and Wednesday, one on Wednesday evening, and you see the professors listed there. And you, just so you know, once you get to the spring semester, you'll see some of those CSYE sections you might be interested start to open up and you'll be eligible for. Couple links here. Uh, Again, these are the important ones, the link to the catalog page. If you have any questions, you can look up quickly the a brief description of all the courses and the electives that you might be interested in taking during your time here, um, as well as um, the pre-registration link. Um, I know it's a long link, but it's just to remind you, use these leading up in the next couple of days if you wanna double check anything. Okay, so this is a pretty important slide um, that I'm gonna try to talk about with you guys, and I know you've heard a lot as well. Who should I see if I have a problem? So during your time here, a lot of you are coming to Boston for the first time. There's gonna be a lot of different things that you're feeling and that come up during your, during your time as a student. 
Uh, it can be very overwhelming right now, but even as you continue, as you get into your studies, as you make friends, as you try to balance exploring the city and whatnot. Um, so when it comes to administrative advising questions, Haley, you just heard from, registration, graduation when the time comes, um, OGS questions, um, anything else, go, to, go see Haley, she'll be able to help you with those um, and, or direct you in the right, in the right place to, to help find the correct information. Um, academic questions as they relate to your courses or thinking about your career after Northeastern, okay? We have four full-time faculty members on staff right now in Boston who are there to help you guys kind of figure out what courses you wanna take, what are you interested in? Would the, do you think my background would be a good fit for this class? Can, you know, just really diving in depth to kind of what you wanna study, okay? Or thinking beyond that, you know, five years down the line, 10 years down the line, careers, what, what in, how, how do you wanna integrate into the industry and what do you wanna learn? Um, we have, fa our full-time faculty are amazing professors, they're here to help you, and they can really, they can really guide you in the right direction. Um, personal crises affecting my degree, these are a little bit more, you know, serious issues you might not know about right now. These could be family emergencies that come up. Um, just feeling amazingly overwhelmed that you don't even know who to go to. Um, you know, Professor Bugrara is the program director for you guys. He's here to help you. Um, he takes a deep interest in his students and he wants to see you guys succeed. So when there are things that unexpectedly come up, and they will, you know, and you're, you just don't know who to go to or you don't know how serious the matter is, go to Professor Bugrara and he'll be able to help you on things that might be outside the realm of your studies. And then if you forget all of this information, you can come to me and I will scold you for it. But no, I'm just kidding. Um, I can advise you to go, who to go to. Um, you don't know, it could, be, it could fall in between. I don't know if this is a, a course registration issue or a question for a faculty member or what. Come to me. Um, I sit on the fifth floor of Dana, that's kind of our MGen unit up there, and I can speak, you, I can speak with you to kind of walk, work through it or uh, guide you in the right direction, okay? Um, so that's it for me. Quickly, I just wanna, while I'm on this slide, I wanna introduce one of our full-time faculty, um, Robin Hilliard, who just wants to, he was kind enough to be with us tonight. He's just gonna say a few words, introduce himself, because he's, he's a professor whose name you saw on quite a few courses up there. Um, so he's just gonna have a quick word with you guys. Thank you. Oh, this one, okay. Oh, great to see you all here. Um, I teach two, two courses. One is the uh, program structure and uh, algorithms class, the Info 6205, which Sam just mentioned. The other is a CSYE class, which is um, Scala and Big Data. Um, I love both my classes, and I think that Every one of you needs to do the algorithms class at some point, not necessarily in your first semester, but it wouldn't be a bad idea. As you know, um, when companies interview you for jobs, the one thing that every company now does is they will give you coding uh, exercises to do. This means that you need to know how to write algorithms, how algorithms work. And you need to know the standard algorithms like quick sort, merge sort, that sort of thing. So we have a lot of fun in the class. I, I have a lot of fun teaching it. Um, I do try to explain, not just, not just give you a list of algorithms because I think that would be a little bit tedious and, and hard to remember, but I really try to explain to you why these algorithms work in the way they do and what are the general themes for um, finding difficult problems and breaking them up into smaller problems. So, I uh, hope to see many of you there and um, best of luck and uh, 
have fun settling in. Thank you. All right. Uh, so right now, we're, I'm going to introduce uh, two of our graduate student ambassadors here in Boston um, for the IS program, Rohan and Malik. And they're just going to speak with you a little bit about what they do as graduate ambassadors. Um, their amazing representation of IS students, and they're, gonna, they're another great resource for you guys, um, peers of yours who you can come and, and work with and, and get a lot of useful information from guys who have been students here, okay? So they're gonna speak for, to you for a couple minutes, introduce themselves and what they can help you with. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Malik, the student ambassador for information system. And I take this opportunity to welcome you all into Northeastern. Uh, I'm uh, like, uh, I'm here to brief you about how we could help you around your master's program um, as an ambassador. So I work with another ambassador, Rohan here, uh, so to provide the best and most useful information on various questions you may have throughout your master's program. So if you have any queries uh, related to um, anything, uh, your co-op or uh, your course selection or your uh, laptop configuration for any kind of courses or course grading criteria, feel free to reach us and uh, we would happy to help you in every way we could. And uh, lastly, I would like to give a suggestion as a student of Northeastern is our university is a treasure cove of opportunity where uh, for anyone who knows where to hunt. So it's up to us to take the right opportunity on right time. So, uh, so I wish you all success. Welcome to Northeastern. Hi, thank, thank you Malik, it was really good listening to you. Good evening guys, I hope you all are having a very excellent evening. Uh, just to give you an introduction, uh, I'm a graduate student ambassador for information systems program for the Boston campus and you might have heard me speaking on most of the webinars that we used to conduct being a part of this team. So that was one of the thing that we used to do, being an ambassador. There are various other responsibilities that we have to cater to talking to a global group of students when we are an ambassador. And that's how you get a global exposure. And at the same time, you try to figure out the best and the most feasible way of getting in touch with maximum number of students. And that's what we used to do, being a part of team. Um, next up, if anybody of you is like interested in being an ambassador, yeah, you are totally welcome to do that. But for that, you need to be in very good academic standings. You should be a person who can match the vibes and think of helping new incoming students and at the same time, you know, be a good team player. So. We expect many of you to come across to me or Malik, and we can talk more about it. Also, like I and Malik would be interviewing you, so be good to us. So that's pretty much I had to say. So Malik already mentioned, you can come up to us for any questions, may it be academic related, may it be uh, related to co-ops, cracking interviews, how should you be, you know, as small as like, which course to select from or till the point that which company to go with. We, are, we can help you across this spectrum. We will do our level best to answer your questions. So we welcome you all. It's, it's a great place. You'll enjoy your course. Professor Bugrara and his entire team of faculties is the most best I have ever seen. So make the most out of it and all the very best to you guys. Thank you.
All right. So that's going to do it for my section, I suppose. And uh, I'm just going to quickly introduce you guys to our co-op advisors for the IS program. We have an amazing team, and they're going to speak with you in depth about the uh, co-op program. So I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Marikla Perosi, Professor, Professor Jessica Fisher, and Professor Laura Meyer. Hello, everybody. Welcome. So I am the COP director, and this is my team. It's my. Can you guys hear me? No. Yeah. Okay. I have told both. Okay. Sorry. You can see I'm not the most technical person. <laughs> You're gonna learn about this about me. Um, so anyway, thank you for coming to Northeastern. This will be your next home for the next two years. So I want to introduce Jessica. She's my left arm. Come here. <laughs> Can you guys give a round of applause, please? Thank you. And my right arms, Laura Mayer. And then, and then I'm just going to leave because I don't do anything. They do my jobs. That's not true. All right. Am I first? Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. So, oh, wow. Let's see how close I can get and not fall off. So, in order for you to be... In order for you to be eligible to go on co-op, you need to take a class, which is your requirement for co-op. That class is called ENCP 6000, Career Management for Engineers. And in that class, um, there's a whole wealth of knowledge and information and skills that you're going to learn and put into effect to help you be able to search more efficiently for your co-op, perform better on an interview, and hopefully land that job. So let's run through a couple bullet points, okay? So first of all, the value of the class is the following. You're going to learn industry trends and the US job market through a speaker session that we offer each semester. So it's usually on Fridays, is that when we're, it's usually on Friday evenings. Um, and we've already begun to schedule for this semester. So watch your emails and be prepared to be able to attend and learn from people who are working in the industry, people from HR to um, CTOs, directors, anybody. So another thing is that we want you to understand that getting a co-op is really hard work. Our class, the Career Management for Engineers, is a challenging class. It's definitely not something that you're just going to be able to write off as a nothing. You do have to work. And in that class, what we are trying to do is prepare you to be successful in the United States. Most of you, if not all of you, are coming from different countries, and so stepping into this place is a really different experience, and we want you to become familiar with that. So we want you to understand that you're going to work very, very hard to get that co-op as well as do well in our course. Um, we also want you to understand that your co-op is not required for your program. And your co-op is also not going to be guaranteed. It's incredibly competitive. You are competing and companies are competing for you and you're competing against your friends and it's just, it can be a high level intensity environment, but we're here for you through the entire way to support you, to be your cheerleaders, and sometimes even to give you that little kick that you might need to get going. Okay, we're good at that. A couple of us are moms, so the rest of us are teachers, so we've been there. Um, also, our job is to give you the tools as well. So, to take a look at some of the learning objectives that we cover in the course. First of all, we start off with creating your personal identity using things like a positioning statement, your resume, and creating um, even networking profiles. And that's the, the front piece, and that's who you're going to be telling people who you are. And you're going to be able to define yourself through those pieces, okay? Another thing that we do is we give you career-relevant co-op 
um, searching tools like LinkedIn, um, Indeed.com. We walk you around how it all works. We introduce you to the um, Northeastern job site, and that's NU Careers. And um, I know a lot of you have already been emailing us with questions. How do we get access? How does this happen? And we just want you to know that um, as fall students coming in, you will not have access to that until, I believe, February. Is that maybe the last week of January? So you don't need to worry about that for right now. You're not eligible for a co-op until summer, okay? You have to do a complete year first. And um, I'm going to interrupt myself real quick. When you email us, make sure that you are emailing us at, can we back up to that? Notice our email addresses, right? They are at northeastern.edu. Your email address is at husky.neu.edu. And a lot of times students will come to us and say, but I sent you an email, but I sent you an email. Like, we didn't get it. And then we find out that they sent us an email at lmeyer at husky. And that's why we didn't get it. So make sure you're using at Northeastern, OK? Thanks. Can you go back? Okay, so the next thing, um, we walk you through how to do technical and behavioral interviews. Um, these are some things that we not only give you the tools in practice through teaching, but we have you practice as well. And one thing that we did last year is we had some of our students who had very successful interviews come on in and give um, some seminars on how to practice, how to go about acing that technical interview, because it can trip up you know, trip you up. So again, we're just going to shove as much information into you as we possibly can. And then also, one of the last topics that we cover are ethics and professional behavior on the workplace, okay? And then what happens if you, you know, send out like 25 resumes and you don't hear anything and you start to get frustrated? Well, part of that, you know, on one hand, that's life, that's the way it works, it's competitive. On the other hand, how do you respond to that, right? So we wanna help you know, give you tips on what should your mindset be? What should your goals be? How do you overcome that? You know, what are the pieces and parts, okay? So I'm gonna hand both of these mics over to Jessica and she's gonna continue. Excellent. All right, uh, yeah. All right, I may stand over here then. All right, so good evening, everybody. Welcome to Northeastern. So we're really excited to have you here. Um, I'm gonna go over for co-op some of the eligibility requirements. So some of this has already been stated, but we are stating it for a purpose. Um, first of all, a co-op, it really, it, it's not guaranteed. It's not a right. You have to put in the work, you have to put in the effort, just like you do in your academic courses. So in order to go on co-op, you need to have at least 16 semester credit hours, okay? You have had to pass the ENCP 6000 course. So although it may be a one credit course, if you're not passing it, if you get an incomplete, you can't go on co-op. Um, also, you need to make sure that you have at least one course left after you finish your co-op. So you have to have an on-ground class. It can't be an online class. It has to be an on-ground class after you do your co-op. So make sure that you're planning your semester, semesters accordingly. Um, and only one co-op is required and is permitted. So you can't do two co-ops. It has to be one co-op only. Can you all repeat that? How many co-ops can you go on? One. All right, say it again. One. Good, so um, for to reiterate all of the co-op policies and procedures, um, I've listed the li links up there, so make sure, similar to the academic policies and the courses, um, you should really review that information. Um, now to get you um, excited about the co-ops, because all of you, we have faith that you're here, you got in here for a reason, and you will be successful, we hope, in utilizing the tools and resources in landing a co-op. That is our goals for you. Now, you guys have to put in the effort, but um, to get you excited, these are some companies that students have done their co-op at. As you can see, you probably recognize some big names up here. 
So we can click go through them all to get you excited, keep you motivated so you can... There we are. So these are just some of the, the companies. Um, and we are going to have student representatives that are going to be speaking um, about the companies. But as you can see, that in 2017 alone, we've placed 498 employers have benefited from the MGEM program for the co-ops. So, um, and these students have gone in 27 states across the US. And so this is just a sampling as well as global opportunities for co-ops. All right, so now um, is probably gonna be the best part of the evening because you get to hear from students that have had successful co-ops. So without further ado, here's Marika. Thank you. Thank you, you guys did a great job. Okay. Oh, my text not here. So um, as they say, co-op, it's, it's not a right, it's a privilege. You have to earn it. It's a hard work, commitment, go extra miles. And I have the pleasure tonight um, to have some of my students, because they're all mine, that's what I say. Um, they have had an amazing experience with their co-op. And I'm sorry, I'm terrible with names, so uh, I apologize. They're going to laugh when I'm going to call their names. So um, Alex, because I cannot pronounce your real name, Fang uh, He, right? Come here. Can you guys give a round of applause, please? We're going to call everybody. Varun. Come on. So Vangta actually is in India, so he couldn't join us. Mayur. It's actually Mayuresh, right? <laughs> okay. Sorry. Okay, sorry. And well, we're missing one person. Prudvi, I'm sorry. You're not on. <laughs> we don't have a picture of you because he's shy. That's why. <laughs> so his name is Prudvi, no? What's, his, what's, the, what's how you pronounce that? Sorry, uh, Prudvi. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so anyway, thank you guys for coming here tonight. And I'm going to give the microphones to them. They have an amazing story. I want you guys to hear it. I'm proud of them. Hi. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. They are nervous, so please. Right. Hang on. This is what you have to hold. Uh -oh. These two. Oh. Oh, do I get there? Yeah. So like this. Okay. Right. Yeah. So good evening, dear students. Um, my name is Fang Ning He, but you can call me Alex for short if you like. So it's my great honor to be here to share my stories with you guys. So um, my major is information system, uh, just like you guys, and I graduated this semester. So I had my co-op at, uh, uh, at a startup company called Food for All in Cambridge, uh, very close. Um, um, and uh, 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 I was working as a software engineer and concentrating both on the front end and the back end. So since it was a, a sub company, I could get my hands on the whole process of the web applications, uh, 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 developing the web applications. And sometimes in the uh, co-op in the big company, you can only touch a small portion of the workflow. And uh, in addition, I was, I was uh, developing a lot of interpersonal skills uh, working within a team. So uh, just like the uh, strong technical skills, you have to have the interpersonal skill as a must have in job hunting. And the most precious part uh, from the co-op for me is uh, I figured out uh, what kind of job can make me feel most uh, uh, excited. So uh, without that part, the co-op uh, experience, I could not find my current full-time job. So now, uh, after graduation, I found a job at MathWorks and uh, as a quality engineer, uh, writing automated tasks uh, with my, uh, my lab and JavaScript. I really enjoyed the job, because the MathWorks uh, guaranteed employees with the balance uh, be between 
uh, life and work. So today I'm here not standing the super smart people, but, uh, but for the uh, hardworking students with dreams. So my undergraduate is accounting. So uh, although I have one year working experience uh, related to IT field, but it was uh, really a hard switch for me to study in the US. So if you guys, just like me, uh, uh, welcome to me for advices. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, very good evening. Welcome to Northeastern, and welcome to the IS program. My name is Varun Murthy, and I'm a fall 17 student. I'm right now on an eight-month co-op at Six River Systems. Uh, Six River Systems is basically a warehouse robotics startup, and we are based out of Waltham. So I've been four months into the co-op, and the experience has been brilliant. It's just been amazing. The reason being that from the start, I never knew what an industry experience was because I just came here directly after finishing my undergrad back in India. So I always long for that industry experience, and out here, getting the co-op was a big win for me. Uh, some of my responsibilities as a uh, QA co-op at uh, Six Rivers was to de uh, design various uh, Kubernetes and uh, AWS clusters for uh, our engineering services team. Also, I uh, had an individual project wherein I uh, designed like a tool for client-side monitoring and alerting systems, which is being used over all our customer sites right now. I also got the opportunity to work on the robotic operating system, the ROS, what we call it in short, because I had an electronics background. So with all of that, I feel that I really hit the jackpot with this co-op. And that wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't followed all the rules that Marie Claire and the team you know, taught me through the ENCP 6000 class. And I was never gonna take that class in my first semester because I was so scared uh, that I might not be able to handle the course load, but yeah, it all worked out and I got my co-op. And uh, I have four more months to go and I'm looking for an awesome experience and hoping so that this co-op would help me decide my future career path. Thank you. Hi, uh, good evening. Guys, good evening. <laughs> yeah, first of all, I would like to congratulate you for just being here because it's very difficult to be here. You're amongst like uh, maybe millions of applications and you're just like few, so a big round of applause for you guys. <laughs> so I'm here to just talk about what my co-op did. So I worked as an BI developer at an investment management firm based out in Boston. So I did typical BI solutions and I designed the solutions using Python and all those big languages. But the main outcome of the co-op was, it changed my mindset to look at the things. Like, uh, you uh, should always remember that there's always a better way of doing things. And just opening your mind to that just opens the entire world to you. So this was the main thing that I learned out of my co-op. The other thing that I learned was just to take baby steps, not to think about five years from now, just think about a month from now. And it will really help you guys to decide. It will help even the co-op faculties to make sure what you're planning to do. And I would like to end it uh, by saying that you must have heard the co-op faculty saying that co-op is not guaranteed. It's not your right. It's like a price. It is because of reason, because co-op is the only and only time when you will be paid to learn. You will be paid to gain an experience, and you will be paid to do some small mistakes, not blunders, just some small mistakes. So just enjoy, enjoy your masters, make sure you listen to the core faculties, make sure you take the best out of Professor Bograro sitting right there. He will train you for the entire process and your entire journey of your masters. Thank you guys. Uh, good evening everyone, sorry I, I had a bad base today. Uh, first of all I wanna congratulate everyone uh, for taking a smart decision of choosing Northeastern. Uh, I'm, I'm Nayan, a recent graduate from Northeastern University, and I'm here to share my co-op experience and my two years of journey with Northeastern University. 
I had eight months of co-op as a software developer at Fresanius Medical Care. Just like you guys, before two years, I have registered for courses like application engineering development, web tools, algorithms, and ENCP 6000, uh, which helped me to get a co-op as a software developer. During my journey or uh, my tenure with a Fresanius organization of eight months period, uh, the company was undergoing a major migration. Uh, it said no more old legacy systems. We are completely moving to the cloud. So at that time, I have registered for a course called Cloud Computing, which helped me to master skills like infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, data as a service. So what I want to say is like uh, the course that even you choose during a co-op period is also very important. It should be aligned to your job role. So when I look back, uh, I would say the eight months of co-op is a game changer for me in my life. Today, I end up seeing myself as a cloud engineer at Oracle. That's, that's a big dream for me. So uh, I'm pretty much sure how many of you are really hungry here uh, to, to grab few good job positions at big companies. When I say big companies, it's really big. I'm talking about big fish like Amazon, Google, Oracle, IBM. So. Uh, like, choose your coursework wisely, know your interest, know your job positions that you're targeting for, and completely, like, you know, have a good focus on ENCP 6000. I'm going to bet my entire life, after two years, everyone out here are going to end up with bright colors. And I'm saying this with a lot of confidence because I have the trust on Northeastern Co-op and the program because I worked as a teaching assistant for uh, Professor Marikla. So I was very close to the co-op team. I know how the workflow is designed and the connections that we have with the big MNCs is mind blowing. So it's, it's big in number that you people can't even imagine. So all the good luck folks. So I wish you are gonna have a good time for the next two years and good luck everyone. Thank you. Did you guys like it? Yeah, right? So it means you guys can be here in two years, right? <laughs> uh? Maybe one and a half, right? That's true, like you. So anyway, this story is amazing. So he got a co-op. After that, he got a full-time offer in the same company. He got a co-op after he got a full-time offer in a different company. Actually, he had two offers. I'm going to share this with you, right? Can I say? <laughs> uh, he had two offers, State Street and Oracle, and he got Oracle. I mean, yeah, please do it. <laughs> and Alex here, I think it's important that you guys know she have a bachelor degree in finance, right? Yeah. Correct? Yeah. yeah. So she really worked so hard, really hard. She went extra mile, right? <laughs> it's not, the Professor Bugara class are not easy. You guys will see it. Sorry, Carl. <laughs> um, so she really worked really hard and she, was able to get a full-time job at MathWork. MathWork is one of the biggest companies in Boston as a software engineer, right? So the reason why we invite those students here is because those students went the extra mile. They just didn't study, right? To just the 3.0 GPA, that those one they went above and beyond, right? They worked really hard and they are committed and there are a lot of self-discipline there, okay? So I wish you best of luck. Hopefully I see you guys in my class. The lucky one, I'm just kidding. And um, <laughs> I'm not really sure, you can ask my TA. I'm not that kind of strict. <laughs> anyway, we have, a, can I just call my uh, left and right arms here? Uh, Jessica and Laura, come back here one second. <laughs> so we work really hard and we cannot uh, do this amazing job, you know, without all of the support, you guys are going to be successful, okay? I really wish you the best of luck. You want to say something? Welcome to Northeastern. Yeah, yeah welcome and enjoy the time here. Yeah. Enjoy in Boston. All right, so we're going to have just a quick minute break here, and uh, Professor Brugrara is going to address you guys and go through uh, his presentation. So just sit tight for a minute here, and uh, next up will be Professor Brugrara.
Who's taking it? Who's taking it? Who dug the photographer? Sam. Sam. It's going to be this. So this is for the video recording. So you're going to want to. Yeah. Okay. okay, got it. Okay. Hello, everyone. I would like to move around. I don't like to be sitting in a box out there. Uh, this is a very special day for me. You know, I've been doing this for about the last 12 years. There are about four or 5,000 of you out there <laughs> roaming the landscape, contributing, being successful, and so on. So it's, it's a, an amazing experience for me to see you come here and go through this educational experience and just to flourish on the other side. So every single day, I love the experience of my graduates and how well they're doing over there. And here you are. You're gonna be with us for the next two years, going through a, an educational experience that's gonna move you to the real world, you know, uh, with the objective of creating, you know, uh, valuable contributing citizens right for the for this country and for the rest of the world right so uh, so welcome to boston right as i always say we are not mit but we're close <laughs> so watch out mit <laughs> we're coming after you right so uh, so in any case you're one of the most pleasant places to be at for learning 
there are so many things about this program that's been very powerful in our, you know, the most important thing is in our ability to take engineers of different backgrounds and turn them into amazing software engineers. This is our brand. This is what we were able to do, take an average student who were goofing off during col their college days and suddenly they wake up here to the reality of life and figure out a path for them toward success. And I have just one story after another of uh, just how to succeed in a place like this. But, you know, your experience here, this day over here, watching you come, many of you are here for three, four days now. It reminds me when I was 18 years old and I came to this country to study, fresh out of high school. And God help you. <laughs> right? So... Uh, so you're gonna go through a lot of stuff. Uh, definitely this program, it's just been fine-tuned over the years to address the needs of these amazing engineers of different backgrounds, looking at you, looking at your background, what you've been doing, where you come from, and then we look at a dynamic industry that's fast changing and being able to continue to fine tune the program to align these two forces so you can be a successful engineer coming out of here. Right? So, uh, so I wanna talk a little bit about the philosophy and what makes information system different. You know, you're gonna hear me talk a lot about big picture, what it means to be a software engineer but you st you're going to have the basic task of having to learn simple things like Java programming. My head is that how are you going to fix the healthcare system in India or China or Russia <laughs> using technology? All right? These are the large gap that's out there. And when you take the application engineering, you're going to be doing two things. One of them is learning how to program correctly, how to design application co co correctly, and then having to pick up a big social problem that's plugging the world and having to solve it using technology in one single semester. And God help you. <laughs> right? the, uh, so, so I remember you know, a, little, a little story that I tell almost uh, you know, every time we have this event the last three years. One of my... So, we had graduation about three years ago. Uh, one of my students, you know, I was congratulating her. Congratulation, you finished the program. It was May, it was, you know, sunshine. So work, we were walking back from graduation ceremony. She, uh, she just landed a job with Goldman Sachs, just finished. She looked at me and said, Professor, I didn't know I had this in me about herself. And I looked back and I said, oh my God, we've done our job. Because that is the ultimate position we can be in, creating an environment for you that you can find the best in you, right? We're not gonna tell you how to think. We're not gonna put a textbook and say, follow it. We want to help you figure out the best you can be yourself. This is probably the most powerful thing about the educational system in the United States, is how we pull you out so you can be yourself and discover the full potential of how you can be. And there's no program in the US like information system in terms of its flexibility to navigate in such a way to discover the best way, the most exciting, the thing that will bring excitement out of you and be able to succeed in a way that's really natural to who you are as a person. And that is the mission that you have. It's not how you're gonna learn Java, it's by how you're gonna excel in your own way, not my way, not the professor's way, but in your way. 
The program is really a container. We have about 30, 40 different subjects in the program that reflect the IT industry and, it's all, and all of its complexity. That's what we're good at, is looking at the IT industry and seeing the different opportunities you can be in it and be able to find your spot in it. There's so many ways you can succeed in IT. In IT. And we know that very well. And we know your background, and it's your job right now to start in a way to start discovering how you can be your best. That is the mission you have from us. And this is what the professors, the program, Sam, and all of us are here to help you with. We're going to pull you out of where you are. We are not your parents. I am not your father. They're gone. They're back there. Now it's time to step to the plate and figure out how you're going to be yourself. One element I always tell people, resilience. You're coming to a new place. You're going to find challenges beyond belief. You're going to discover weaknesses you didn't know you had. But also you're going to find opportunities like you never thought were possible. And resilience is going to be a key in that process. You're going to be struggling. You're going to be, because you're going through a different culture, different way of thinking, different way of being judged. The standard way my friends are going to help me are gone. Your roommate who looked like your neighbor, nice neighbor back home is not, is not going to be the same anymore. Just the nature of transitioning to a new place, a new culture, and new rules and regulations. I remember myself in high school, I was just number one when it came to science, physics, chemistry, and the like. And I came here as a freshman. I took my chemistry class. I said, oh my God, it takes me a day to read a page. You know, all these skills I had in high school just went out the door and I had to rediscover myself all over again. But guess what happened? So I go from an, a talented mathematician in high school, physicist, chemist. I wanted to build a, a time, but an atom bomb, you know, when I was in high school. Suddenly, none of it worked. And here I am, a programmer. <laughs> I discovered computer science. I took first, my first semester, I had to learn a programming language called Fortran. I did very poorly in it. You know, I, you know, I had a, you know, I ended up a, a girlfriend, a love story, the classes, just everything was a big mess. I bought a new car, didn't have money <laughs> for food anymore. You know, I had to eat chicken bones <laughs> to survive. But semester number two, everything changed. I took my assembly language programming class from a, chemist, a, a, a chemical professor, a chemistry professor that worked on DNA and all the stuff that we see now. And he taught me a few steps about how to write a program, how to do a flow chart. And I looked at the stuff, I said, oh my God, this is me, right? And here, here I am, right? Something totally unexpected that where I discovered, you know, how I can be the best I can be. And this is what you need to do for yourself as well. So if there are a few things to remember here, just you have to find your full potential. You don't want to delay that anymore. This is graduate school right now. Undergraduate years are gone, guys. Watch us, what we're going to do to you. Right? You're going to have about two weeks of getting, uh, get, having fun. Teachers are going to look nice. Everybody's going to look nice. And boy, how about this for your homework? Oh, by the way, on Sunday, you need to come to class. On Tuesday, you need to submit the homework. On Wednesday, you need to talk to your TA. Do a demo of what you have accomplished. You're going to have no life. <laughs> Because you know what? Who do I have on the other side? I have Marikala and her team. <laughs> Your students are not ready. <laughs> okay? This is the 
So I called this co-op team. Uh, we call ourselves the back office <laughs> to the co-op team. <laughs> because they are talking to who? To the people who are going to pay you $100,000. And they aren't going to let that money go out for no reason. <laughs> so we are sandwiched, right? The academics, the teachers are sandwiched between the co-op people, the employers, and you. Right? And this is the job. How do we pull you closer to what's required by the industry? And we're doing everything we can to make sure you're going to be ready. Right? So watch out. You know, one thing about this culture, you're going to find that people are very friendly, very nice, very cooperative, very understanding, but there's another side to why, what makes this, the United States succeed. There's seriousness beyond belief. There's a precision. There are et ethical issues, integrity, that are very essential, and trust that's very essential for people to deal with you. It's no longer this blurry language, oh, I was at home, you know, you can say, no. People will judge you very quickly, will look at you. If you are not being truthful, it will stick to you. There's a professional life, there are responsibilities, so you have to assume that responsibility. As much as we're gonna be flexible and friendly, we have high expectation about your ethics, and your integrity. You ain't going to go anywhere if you don't move yourself to a professional position that people can really do business with you and trust you. Without the trust, nothing is going to happen. So you have to understand that aspect of this culture. Professionalism is very critical. This co-op group that you saw, you, know, you see how funny, how bubbly they are? They ain't like that at the end of the day. Believe me. Your students are not professional enough. I'm not going to work with them. This is what they do to me. All right? So these are the things that you have to make sure you start adjusting yourself. It's not what's in your heart. Oh, I am nice in my heart. I'm truthful. No. You, it's what, what people will see will see your action, not what's in your heart. Right? So we have to figure out how to deal with that stuff. In terms of support system, we're there. If you're failing, we're going to be there to support you and pull you from whatever challenges you have. Right? So, so in any case, these are some of the things I want to say. Uh, I will go through some of the philosophy of the program. Information system especially is uh, very special for me. We built it from scratch about 12 years ago with the idea of an information, of software as an engineering problem. Software is not a programming problem for us. It's an engineering problem. Putting software together is the same like how a bridge engineer would put a bridge together. Because engineering in general have figured out how to deal with complexity. The complexity of putting a skyscraper, the complexity of putting a huge bridge, the complexity of putting the pyramid, these are all engineering techniques and engineering mindset. Why is that important? Because technology is becoming integral to our lives. Technology now is becoming a social, socio-technical issue. So technology is now being used to solve what? Social problems. The social ills of the world right now are being addressed through technology. There's nothing, nothing more efficient than that. Right? So, so in that sense, for us to be able to deal with these social problems, we, uh, that means we have to learn how to deal with complexity. How do we manage a complex situation? Engineering in general, classical engineering, have been good at that for thousands of years. We need to be able to do the same thing with technology. Your application engineering class is going to be at the middle of that stuff. And I'm going to take you through some steps. This is who I am. 
God help you this semester, right? But here is one slide that I pulled from a, uh, a, a bunch of res researchers out of Germany that try to provide some logic to all the stuff that we hear in the market, in all this marketing literature, right? So we talk about machine learning, we talk about AI. What is that, right? What is data analytics? There's a reason for that. And I'm going to make a case for the most important thing is really the last piece, the adaptability. That's what matters to industry more than anything else. But if you look at the history of everything, we had you know, the calculations and computations, then we start learning how to build networks, then we needed to extract the data and make it visible. We do dashboards and reports, okay? Then we had transparency, uh, being able to understand why things the way they are, you know, why data, uh, what's the meaning of the data that we are extracting. And now we're talking about the predictability, being able to read the past, understand what happened in the past, to be able to have forecast the future, be a sense of what's going to happen next. So predicting for a business to be able to understand what's going to happen next is very valuable for them. But, the real thing is adaptability. Now that I can predict the future, or I have a good sense of the future, I want to be able to change. I want to be able to get ahead of my competition. That is where you have to now build your system differently. It's one thing to predict what's going to happen. It's a completely different challenge to now readjust your business. And that is an engineering problem. Because now I understand for me to compete, I have to do things in a certain way. But how do I make a change into my systems? Readopting is an engineering problem because what do I have to do to adopt? I might have to re-engineer my system. And re-engineering is a software engineering problem. No matter how much you do with AI, you still have to be able to have the system change direction. But how would you take your software and make it behave differently is where you have to come in. Okay, what's your technique? How are you going to tackle the problem I have? Are you going to just jump heads first? And so far, in the IT world, we don't have a very powerful methodology to be able to design complex systems. It's all ad hoc. Let's program it and see what happened. I've got Oracle, can come in, help me, blah, 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 and nothing moves forward. So the future for you is going to be how to discover better methods that will allow us to deal with complexity that's going to be necessary to build the agility that we need to run the system more effectively. That's where the story is. And you as a software engineer, within two years, you're going to hear more about adaptability than anything else. How do I change direction fast? Right? This is where companies are right now. Oh my God, I, AI is coming, machine learning is coming. We can't continue the same way anymore. What can we do right now? We had a conversation with Mass General Hospital, the biggest, the most gigantic first class hospital in the world. They have amazing data on all kinds of cancers that they built over the years. And they want to be able to look at the, all that data and be able to figure out a better way to diagnose cancer, for example. But they look at their hospital and still it's an old hospital. Okay. Even if they do some data analysis, they have a way of characterizing cancer cells in the liver, you still have to figure out how you're going to use it more effectively. But they are still stuck in the past when it comes to their systems. Right? So being able to build some analytics that can predict certain things is still not enough of the challenge. In terms of the future, in my view, still how to engineer systems better 
is going to continue to be the best position you can be in. And I know many of you want to focus, well, I want to focus on data, I want to focus on analytics, I want to focus on machine learning, fine. I still would love to see you as a software engineer at the end of the day. Because things are going to be moving and you wanna be, don't want to be stuck in the past. Right? So here is the, this is a nice diagram that I picked up from somewhere. So businesses have chaos, problems. Everywhere you go, this is pretty much the story, all kinds of problems. And the idea, can we redesign the business so it looks better organized? Something that we can understand. There are people, there are organizations, there are roles, there are pie, there's good structure for communication and so on. This is the objective. How do I take a messed up business and turn it into a, a system that can benefit from technology, that can benefit from information, that can benefit from machine learning and so on, right? So that's the objective. So I'm gonna tell you a story. So this is how to be agile and competitive when the current state is like this, right? And every time they try a new project, they try, 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 they get tired of it, cancel everything, next year they will start all over again, right? Right, so, so we don't have time to do it right, but we have time to do it over, right? This is the model we have in the US, right? So here's a little, this is the, here's, here's something that had a huge impact on me. Okay. So we have some, yeah. So here's, so either you're talking about the chaos is, is something there frozen? So I'm going to tell you a story. So uh, around 1992, 93, I, you know, I left academia. I was in the, co I, I had my own consulting practice, and I was doing some work for, for Xerox as a subcontractor. Xerox were going through an amazing transformation. If you heard the word re-engineering, Xerox invented re-engineering. They did an amazing job of figuring out all the requirements and what Xerox needed to do to transform itself to a state-of-the-art company. Why Xerox needed to transform itself to a, a state-of-the-art company? Because Japanese copy, uh, photocopy machines were coming at, at them big time cheaper, faster, and so on. And Xerox couldn't compete the old way. So they've done an amazing job. 1992, 93, Xerox wanted to be an IT company, a digital business company. And I studied their requirements. That Xerox spent about $100 million on that project, on that re-engineering project. But at the end, the Xerox, uh, uh, the project failed. The transformation completely bombed out. So I got to on a study, why did, Xerox, why did that re-engineering project fail at Xerox? Okay? So that study is actually what led to information systems. <laughs> right? Because there were some things that were very important. So, so this is what we're going to be doing in the application engineering class. We're gonna look at complex situations, and we have a methodology that will allow you to map your this chaos to a, a virtual enterprise that looks exactly like that. Not only for one company, you can do it even for an ecosystem of companies, right? And we're gonna use Java programming and the like, but we're gonna have a methodology that will allow us to think of software as if it's a company, a virtual enterprise and how the, the, the application software will come out of it is exactly what we're gonna do, right? So this is no longer, yeah. So, so this is one of the, so as I was studying the Xerox problem, here is Xerox. This is one of the workflows that Xerox came up with. Believe it or not, this is a 1991 slide from Xerox. 
So you look at the top, that's their marketing. The next piece is their sales operations. Then the sales process, then solution delivery, contract management, invoicing, and so on. So this is the overall process flow for the whole company. And now it drills down into more detail. Imagine marketing, sales, solution delivery, payments, and so on, captured in an amazing model. And I looked at the requirements, it was amazing. The details, the precision of the specs. But we have a problem. Us as software engineers, we have no clue what to do with the graph like this. All we know is Java, C, C Sharp, SQL. But Xerox needed to automate this. Xerox needed to become a digital business. But there's no methodology for us to say how this work workflow is going to become an application. So Xerox hired Oracle and EDS. They built something. It's all database stuff. They tried to make it run. Nothing happened. <laughs> so the minute this design became an, up a, an IT issue, everything went south for Xerox. What happened to Xerox because of this failure? So Xerox thought about the right thing. They wanted to make Xerox a global company, fully automated, and that will be a bring efficiency that will allow them to compete with the Japanese companies. But everything failed, and Xerox never, never recovered from that. Do you hear Xerox anymore? It's the failure. So Xerox had the vision they did the right requirements, but once it became an implementation, everything went south. Why? Because there is no methodology. We don't know. We know how to write a small application, but we cannot look at a, a complex system like this and be able to see it as an application. What's the problem? Right? When you look at a flow like this, what's the problem? Where are the people? <laughs> People are not the flow, right? People don't flow, okay? So if you want to think of it, it, there's so much into this, and what you're going to be learning in the application engineering is where is the social structure that will support this flow? That was my study that, I, like I said, led into the different techniques we're going to practice in the software in, in the engineering class. So when we talk about digital business and automation, I need you to be the kind of software engineer that will be able to see, look at stuff like this, say, wait a minute. There's a way how to build these kinds of applications without having to think of SQL and, and data. There's a socio-technical stuff here that's going on that we have to model correctly. So step number one in the program, you have to learn how to model these Social, social, technical business structures, people, function, systems, and the like. So your first look at what you need to do as a software engineer is how to model these business environments correctly. Data analytics are not going to happen until you figured out how to automate these flows. There's no data if there's no application. And it's the applications that eat up the data. So step number one, before you become a data engineer or an analytics engineer or a machine learning guy or an AI guy, you need to know the anatomy of an application. What's the structure and the different pieces of an application? Then you can move to whatever data you want whatever machine learning you want, but the fundamental in it, you still have to position yourself as a software engineer, and you can do it. And these employees are not going to talk to you until you learn how to become a software engineer. Okay? But being, learning, you know, oh, I just want to be a SQL programmer, you're not going to go anywhere with that. I can tell you that. Right? I've seen them, that role is a dangerous role. So we're going to show you the different ways you can succeed without having to be a programmer. Right? Yeah, I'm, uh, you know, professor, I don't like to sit down and writing 
programs. So the application engineering class say, okay, you don't want to write many lines of code. Okay, that's a deal. Let's not write many lines of code. Then let's design it correctly. If you design it correctly, you don't have to program. That's the basic premise in the application engineering. Design means less coding. The reason we write a lot of code, because we, 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 we have a messy design. So the programming actually become a compensation for bad design. And that's what engineering is all about. Where's the design? Okay? And that's what you have to learn first how, what to do. And then we have a good foundation to start moving you in the right direction in terms of what you want to do. So this, is, so this is the methodology in the application engineering. We're going to look at a flow like this, and we're going to move it into a social technical structure that's exactly like that. You look at this and say, well, this is very obvious. I'm going to show you how to have your Java classes that model that social structure exactly as you want it to be organized and make sense, right? And that is the essence of these are the foundations of how to be a good software engineer. So we're not telling you how to be, a, you need to be a software engineer. We're going to show you how to be one. We just need you to get out of that shell you're in and be able to start seeing the opportunities available to you. Okay? So at the heart of it, information systems, we define the information system in these three categories. You probably, if you were in one of these seminars, this is the biggest thing that I talk about, right? That it's, a, it's the, the anytime, anytime you're engineering something, you have three components at least. The world that you're trying to fix, okay? The science and engineering you need, and the time and money and quality you have to achieve, <laughs> right? As a software engineer, whether you like it or not, you're going to be dealing with these three issues all the time. You can sit back and say, I am just the programmer. I don't care about the real world problem. Fine. Right? But people are going to throw stuff at you left or right, and you're never going to be out of that box. While if you have a little bit of attraction to the, to the problem being solved, you are growing. You're growing because as you age, you're going to have more needs and more ambitions, right? So at the heart of it, we say a software engineering is a balance, right? You want to balance these three skills. You have to have an appreciation and interest into the world business, real world complexity you're trying to automate, right? You need the Java programming skills, algorithms, programming languages, and the like. And then you have to understand a little bit about cost and time and their value. So what, what some companies say, well, anytime you build an application, you have three choices, time, money, and quality. And what do they say? Choose two out of three, <laughs> right? You don't have a lot of money, you have to give up on quality. <laughs> You don't have a lot of time, you have to give up on quality. But you can't have all three at once. And now, good luck. Right? And your, your customers looking at you, what are we going to do now? <laughs> we don't have a lot of money, we don't have a lot of time. Right? But we still want the quality. <laughs> right? So what skill sets are you going to show right now to tell them, okay, I think we're still going to be okay. <laughs> right? And it's amazing the stuff that you can do to make sure that, that you still be successful despite all these constraints, right? We want to build the talent to deal with these really super complex issues that need a, need a solution, okay? You don't need to solve them right away, but this is going to be in your future. We need to get you on the basics. But these, this is the essence of who we are as inf information systems. So when I say software as an engineering problem, this is what I'm talking about. So your classes, right? So for the longest time, we've been saying, you, it will be nice if you take your classes 
in these three different areas. Business analysis, for example, right, will be a good class to take. The planning class will, you know, the planning class will be good on the IT management side. Web development will be good on the uh, science and engineering side. So an ideal situation will be two, 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 and then two others that will balance toward the particular area. So IS is really, if you look at all our courses, there are these three different domains. And it's going to be up to you how you're going to veer your career. And our students are all over the place when it comes to these choices. <laughs> They are roommates, they came from the same college, but they're still taking completely different routes. All right? And the more you're going to discover about yourself, the more you're going to see that there are certain things that are more important than others. But professor, how do we set choose? Well, it's going to be a discovery. We're not going to tell you what to do. Students come to me, professor, tell me what to take. I say, go home. I'm not going to tell you anything. I don't want you to be cussing me for about four months, right? For sticking you in the wrong class. You have to go try something. If you fail, you're going to be much smarter next time when you decide on something, right? Now, this is one of the biggest problems our students do. Try, they try to follow others, and then they get in trouble. You have, the sooner you discover what's important to you, the better. A lot of times I tell students, why don't you, if you're not sure about certain classes, and listen to this, right? If you're not sure about certain classes, why don't you go visit the class first week of classes? Look at a number of teachers and what they're saying in the first class about what they're going to achieve. Some of these teachers, more than others, will be of interest to you. So it could be that way how you decide on classes. If you're confused about two classes, don't just follow her. Go to the class and see what the teacher has to say. So our students, you know, teachers say, well, the shopping around week. <laughs> right? Because students are stepping between different classes. Sometimes if you have no other way, then this is how you want to do it. Okay? But because somebody tells you take that class because it's good, that's not necessarily the best advice. You really, your biggest challenge to figure out exactly the best way you can be. But, but the other side, right? Remember, you're going to be going through a lot of change. You know, can I have a, a study plan for my two years here, professor? No. There's no such a thing as a study plan plan in a dynamic industry like IT anymore. It doesn't work, guys. I can give you a plan and say, go follow it, and it will be a disservice to you. For one thing, you're ch every semester you're changing, right? Because of experience you gain. You're coming to a different place, and every day there's something new in your life, right? Every semester you're looking back, how did I make that stupid decision last year, right? So it's better to take it one step at a time, right? Do the first right thing, and let's see what happens next semester, right? That's the best way to go. It's a discovery process is what you have. This is a very vast program with so many choices, and there's little time. So you have to see if you can slowly, semester by semester, discover which area will be best for you. But your worst enemy will be your roommate or your friends when it comes to decisions about classes. Say, hey, I didn't do well in that class. I'm going to have her go take it too. Right? No. <laughs> Don't trust anybody with your classes. Choose for yourself. Build that independence. The reason I'm saying that, because we do have problem with that. Okay, and when it comes to our classes, IS is a vast program. Okay, we're about 1,200 students strong. This is the biggest program in the university, <laughs> right? So, uh, and our classes in these different categories. Where do you want to be? Are you a mobile developer? Are you an AI engineer? 
uh, do you want to be a data science engineer or a big data engineer? How about an application developer? How about a software engineer? There are different ways you can veer your career. Am I making things hard for you? Maybe. But at least I don't have to sit down and make these choices for you. IS is a container program. We need IS to be flexible because of your diverse backgrounds. Okay? And different groups of people have different interests. Why, is it, why you're a diverse group? Because your engineers are coming from different disciplines. You bring a richness that's just amazing when it's mixed with software engineering. And you have to really figure out how to balance your background with this opportunity you have with us here. And of course, the people skills, right? This is one of our features, these soft skills. You know, uh, sometimes I tell students, take a management class. I don't want to take a management class. I want another program. I say these management classes make your technical skills look better. When you know how to communicate, you can explain why you're a good Java programmer, right? So communication, you're not going to be communicating by the writing F then else statements. You have to speak natural language that people can value who you are, right? I am a software engineer that knows how to build healthcare applications, right? I can build them quickly with less time. And by the way, I have this passion to help people of certain disease or something, okay? So, so these uh, people skills and every time, okay? So they look here and say, okay, all I need is a good Java programmer and I'll fix them when it comes. But how about their people skills? The most thing employers ask us about is communication and people skills for engineers because they know what it's like to have a programmer sitting on the machine doesn't, doesn't, cannot, <laughs> cannot explain anything, right? People sit down on their machine writing code the whole day. When you say explain to us exactly what you wrote and they have, they either don't know, they don't want to, right? And that's, that's a problem for a software project with people that cannot explain what they're doing or they're not willing to communicate. So the quality assurance class has been off the book for a while, but we're bringing it back this semester. So we're putting on the schedule. We find somebody who's, uh, who's going to teach that. Quality is very important in software. And it's one of the, these fields where you don't need to be heavy on the programming side. But it's an important, com nothing happens. The software will never see the light if the QA people don't sign on it. <laughs> OK? Right? So it's an important function, and usually when you find a software engineer that's willing to do a QA job, you become a star. Because now you can communicate to these bozos on the other side that don't want to speak English. Right? So, uh, so in any case, so this is the nature of the program. We're in different areas. Cloud computing is a big thing, and that's primarily on the computer system engineering side. So. Uh, IS has a sister program called Computer System Engineering. You can take classes there. Computer System Engineering is heavily technical, while in IS you have more choices. Okay, so, so uh, that, that program is shifting toward the heavy, heavy technical stuff. But all the courses that we have in Computer System Engineering are available to you. One of the hottest classes there out of computer system engineering, the cloud computing class. We have an amazing teacher that's been teaching uh, amazing stuff in that stuff. And, and it's heavily in heavy demand for software engineers that they have some cloud computing skills. Now we're introducing an advanced cloud computing class. All right? And of course, my, my passion and my work right now is primarily on blockchain side. So how do we put an application framework on top of the blockchain. This is what I do every single day. There's just amazing opportunities in that space. And some of you who might be already well-founded when it comes to programming and have good programming skills, my advice to them, maybe you might want to take the blockchain route from the beginning. The cryptocurrency class is number one. 
And I would highly recommend those who are well ready technically, maybe they should go the cryptocurrency right away. That area, that world is exploding right now. The, in a few years, you will never see a, a dollar <laughs> bill anymore. It's amazing. The way we're building software right now is there's no software license anymore. You use the software, there's a currency that you have to pay. Right? And the currency is going to be paid in tokens, and tokens are going to be distributed to the developers, to the investors, all part of the software. So the software itself is becoming a, a complete business with its investors, operations, and everything else, right? And we're thinking, you know, we're building the kinds of applications that are going to be here. Okay. All right, next. So that's the main, then we can get into, uh, okay, so we're going to go through these quickly. So we have rec uh, recommended guidelines, how you should uh, look at the classes. You know, the, the, each category represents what employers are looking for. Okay? And then these are guidelines. They are not requirements. They are guidelines. You can choose to follow them. Maybe you choose not. All right? But it, big data engineer, this is what we recommend if you want to be a big data engineer. All right? All right? So we, you, you will have these slides. User experience is one of my favorite areas. So we have user experience design, the web design where you do HTML style sheets. Then the virtual environments, we have class in that space. But if even if on the user experience, you might need the agile class, the project planning class, communication for manager, business analysis. You see how this is a soft track. You still have to take the application engineering, but you can see it's mostly on the user interface side. Is that important? Absolutely. What makes a Tesla a Tesla? It's not, it's a four-wheeler, right, that goes from A to B. It's what? It's this amazing experience where you feel you're on top of the world, right? That's what people pay for. So the price of your software project is determined by the user experience, <laughs> not how hard you work it on the back end. Okay? Nobody cares about that. But how it looks determines its value. And it's a, this is one of the most important areas. When you have a software engineer that has a, a feel for the artistic side of what attracts a customer, it's, it's just uh, highly needed, right? What makes Apple what Apple is? Steve Jobs and his study of what? Industrial design. Right? This is what got Steve Jobs to, get, to make uh, the Apple what it is today. His ability to focus on the user experience. Look at your, your phone and how simple it is to use. Right? This is all coming from these principles of what hap how to think of an intuitive user interface. That's not an easy thing. You need to focus on it, but there's just an amazing career in this space. Okay, next. So the analytics are there. We have one of the best data where business intelligence uh, classes. We have the guy who wrote the book on business intelligence, right? So this is what we call uh, now is referred to as the, uh, uh, I guess, designing data architecture and business intelligence systems, right? So in any case, this is the uh, analytics side if you want to focus on it. Uh, next, the cybersecurity track. Next, mobile computing, what we recommend for it. Yeah, next, digital business. Again, this is the softer side if you want to be a business architect. On the requirements side, this is what the classes we recommend for that space. Next, then uh, this is the most popular of them all for those IS students who want to be heavily technical. They call themselves, I'm a full stack developer professor, right? <clears throat> so these are the guys who want to go work for Google and Amazon and the like, you know, the heavy duty technical stuff and surely the application engineering, the cloud computing, the algorithms, the web development, concurrent uh, processes, right? A web design class wouldn't be a bad idea. 
that if you're good with JavaScript, that will just add to a full, pro a full stack. That means you can do front end and back end, right? And that's how you get your Google job interview. OK, next. Yeah, then this is the hot stuff that people, I want to be a data scientist professor, but I forgot my statistics and probability. <laughs> You know, and I look at it and say, oh my God, you know, if you, if you haven't gotten your probability by now, it's too late. <laughs> so I am not heavy on encouraging students to go back and do, redo their math. <laughs> Engineers are not necessarily great mathematicians. You know, so uh, having been humbled by the mathematics I needed for my PhD thesis, I tell people, you know, you might have an easier life being a data science engineer. You sit down and do, this, do the math, calculate the error rates, control the error rates, and I will build the data pipeline for you. 80% of all machine learning projects is in data engineering work. So they hire these data scientists and they end up spending the whole year figuring out how to integrate the data together and make sense of the data. Right? So the complaints people have from students who, who go after these kinds of jobs is that students know how to use libraries, but they don't know what's going on. And that's bad, okay? You can explain the library you use, but you cannot explain the error rates or people having problems with their probability distributions and the difference between the different probability. That's a problem. That doesn't, to me, say you're in the wrong field. And now you're competing with mathematicians, with PhDs, and the like. But there's a strong desire for many of our students to be in data science area and machine learning area. You still can, there's a huge opportunity there, but be on the data engineering side of that stuff. It's much better position because you are need, desperately needed in that space. Why? You're avoiding the opportunity and focusing on the theoretical aspect of the work. And it's a big problem right now, okay? So people write this stuff and making predictions with no real facts to, pro uh, to support the work. It's very dangerous, right? So use machine learning to say, here's how you should classify uh, cancer cells. Well, can you prove to me that actually this program is gonna work in general? <laughs> I don't know. Then we have a problem. How useful is that if you can show that it works? Okay, next. And this is, I, like I said, this is where the real world is right now. You know, how fast can you get to the space is really your biggest issue because next year, everybody's gonna be talking about cryptocurrency and blockchain. So we need you to move fast. That may be year two, that could be your focus. Right? The future of money is here. So remember, it's the king always controlled the money. <laughs> right? That's how you control society. <laughs> right? This is what governments do. Right? This cryptocurrency business is going to democratize money. <laughs> so a little guy in Madagascar could become a rich person without ever having to leave Madagascar. Why? trading cryptocurrency on the internet, right? So there's gonna be a huge power shift. If you thought the internet was a major revolution, watch what's gonna happen here. Because it's almost the internet of value, right? The internet of value itself. That what we're exchanging is money, right? Or value or benefits. And this is what we're spending a lot of, myself spending a lot of time. There are so many problems I can share with you. Maybe we can do some presentations on this stuff one of these days, yeah. Okay. So I think the, yeah, can I have one of the, the videos? So I wanna share with you some of the, uh, let's see. Okay, so if you can stop it for a second. So this is, I wanna show you student work. Okay, so our students, so this is, uh, her name is Yi Ming. She worked with me on how to automate complex contracts when you have 10, 15, 20 lenders for one borrower. Like Facebook will be a borrower, 
they need $200 million in two hours, and there will be 50 banks to supply them with that money. So we put this on the blockchain. She went from zero, good programmer, no Java expertise, no blockchain expertise, no design expertise, but within one semester, this is her work. We put it on a video, right? Your phone is your identity on the blockchain. That's not part of the demo. <laughs> this is an ad. <laughs> OK, so can we uh, look at the other? So I was showing, you know, my point is primarily to do with how certain project or certain experience can transform a student. Taking classes is one thing. Doing a meaningful project, you can grow tremendously. All right? So, and I think what you're going to find in, with all our classes, about 30% of the grade is going to be a final project where you have to find a good problem, you want to solve that problem, and it becomes a very meaningful experience on your resume. Okay, so all our classes have that aspect to it. There's every single class has a big project, and those projects end up on the resume as a way to compensate for the lack of industrial experience, right? Okay. Yeah, so I think we're running out of time, so if you can switch to the, uh, the e-signature one, right? So, the, right, yeah, so this is something, okay? It started with zero. One of the students couldn't have co-op, you know, could, could barely speak English, still close to graduation, could barely speak English. He came to me, Professor, I need a project. Uh, and I got her to work on this project. We knew nothing about the solution to this problem. But the problem was, can you stop it for a second? Yeah. So, so this is a problem we got from a bank that wanted to do electronic signature in a different way. They want to do electronic signature on the blockchain. The problem they have is their customers are far away it takes them two, three months before they show to the office to sign a contract. So the contract starts running without, uh, without signing. They want to be able to transmit the contract electronically to the borrower over a mobile device, and they can sign from their tablet or the like. But they want it to withstand legal scrutiny, right? So this is the work she worked on, how a lender and a bunch of borrowers can, can cooperate together to get all the electronic signatures worked out correctly. It was zero expertise, zero knowledge what the problem is, but the discovery process that the student went, went into that led to this application, right? So this is where zero skills suddenly, if you're willing to try, you can do amazing thing. When the bank looked at this, they were stunned with the, with the outcome of this project. So this is a feel what our students are capable of doing. And this is what you will have to do yourself within a year or two. OK. So this identity is going to be created on top of the blockchain. So the lender now is going to uh, audit, uh, create a contract. Okay, so 
so the they approve the the request now the person is in the system now a contract is being drafted for the customer and how many borrowers are going to be involved in the contract different data elements for the contract are, are being uh, drafted now okay and now the contract document. So this is a template where the data, the, the term sheet is going to be integrated with the text. And now the signature will be scanning over the phone. Now the second, the borrow, second borrower is going to go in, or the borrower is going to go in and be able to sign the contract. All right. So the lender now looking at the two, uh, th there are two borrowers, neither one of them signed. So this will be signed by scanning the QR code. With day two things were signed. Now the second borrower is going to go in and sign. So you get the CFO and the CEO both signing the contract. So this was all a discovery process. We had no idea what was needed. Right? So keeping the data separate from the text was a big deal. That allows for analytics they've never seen before. Okay, the signature again, this is all blockchain stuff. Right. So this is a feel, right? This is good enough, uh, Sam. Just giving you a feel for the user experience you need to build. So you need to be able to program it, but at the same time, how are you gonna design the user experience? This is a, this flow, how, to, how multiple people can sign a contract correctly where the lender can understand, did they sign, did they not, who signed first, who not. Was a, uh, we were trying to put the stuff on the blockchain, but turned out actually the, the co coordinating the signatures between different people became a big issue. So part of the discovery, we discovered that there is a flow, how people are gonna sign, and how do you know whether the other signed or not, right? So this is all by sitting down and patiently work through different designs, will this work, will it not? This is how your customers are going to be. We don't know what we want. You know, you're going, to get, you're going to get paid, so you better figure out how to do it for me. And if I don't like it, I want my money back. <laughs> That's a huge set of responsibilities. So in any case, so this is just a feel for who we are, right? The focus, the program. Again, in summary, the program is very diverse. And you, ha you have the task of figuring out exactly how you want to leverage the flexibility of the program to create a profile that fits you best. You're going to discover that this is the reality sooner or later. All right? And you need to start building passion. You need to start getting the doubt of your head and just push ahead. You're going to be okay. Oh, Maybe, maybe I'm missing something by not doing hers. No, forget about hers. Okay? So, in any case, welcome to Northeastern and to the IS program. I'm so proud and happy to have you. You're going to see amazing teachers here. Thank you so much. So, I will see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you. We're all good? Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, everyone. Uh, as Professor Bagrara just said, thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, we really appreciate you guys being here, and uh, that's it. You guys are free to leave. 
Um, get home safe. And uh, we'll linger around here if any of you have specific questions. But uh, other than that, classes start on uh, next Wednesday. So we'll see you all then. Thanks.